the meeting I talk about in 16, yes. And you say in paragraph 16 of your witness statement, quote, in October 2012, when I discovered what had happened and realized the importance of these sales to the voters, I became extremely concerned and made a trip, singular, to Boston to meet with Horace to discuss what to do, close quote. Correct? Yes, there, so, there so must have been only one trip then. There was only one trip. Yes. Thank you. And that trip was in the middle of October. Yes. Uh, and yet, in your description of the trip, well, let's just take a look through it if we can. Let's, uh, let's see if we can go through um, some of the uh, statements that you said were made uh, during this trip. We started, I guess, uh, already with this notion that in October 2012, you discovered what had happened and you became extremely concerned, correct? We've talked about this, yes. Correct. And is it fair to say that while you were extremely concerned, Horace was not? I have no idea whether he was or not. Well, you tell us in paragraph 16, Ms. Montero, that Horace told me that the pressure would soon be off. That's what he said. And Whether he was concerned or not in behind all of this, I have no idea. And that was right after you tell us that you went there because you were extremely concerned. I certainly Correct? was, but I lived there. He doesn't. And you also told us that he gave this explanation as to why after the government and the press understood that Fremont had only sold coal that was not needed for the operation of the power plant, and he further said that the proceeds of the sale were only temporarily in bank accounts, and that they or a portion of them would be brought back into the country. He gave you comfort, isn't that correct? That this situation I, would sort itself out. Isn't that what you're telling us? I am telling you that it was either wishful thinking on his part, or he was trying to protect his own back. Whether it was his own concern or, or not, I have no idea. Well. You do tell us in paragraph 17 that in the meantime, he asked you as a member of the bar of Juristania who participated in the negotiation of the contract, I'm reading your words here, what the legal position of Fremont was under the contract with government. And you say, I told Horace what the contract said and told him that it was not wholly clear that all the coal taken from the mine had to be used for no other purpose than in the power plant, close quotes. Correct? I told him what the contract said, and I said it was not wholly clear. Yes, that's exactly right. You told him that the contract was not clear. Isn't that correct? I told, I, I quote, I, I literally, I remember, I literally quoted section four to him, and I said to him, well, it doesn't say anything about, this, about those other sales, so it's not clear. That's Ms. what I Mont said. And Ms. Montero, your witness statement says, Quote, I told Horace what the contract said and told him that it was not wholly clear. Close quotes. That's what your statement says, that's isn't it? That's what I just said, yes. And that's not what you've told this tribunal in paragraph 10 of your witness statement, is it? What have I said in paragraph 10? Well, let me quote it to you. You say in paragraph 10, as can be seen from reading section 4 of the contract with the government, there was no restriction on the sale of coal to buyers of coal apart from the power, power plant. The contract says Fremont is hereby granted all rights to mine and use coal in the coal mining area in Teixuku province over the term of this contract." Close quotes. That's what you say in paragraph 10, correct? That's what's written there, yes. Okay. And isn't it the case, Ms. Montero, that what you told Mr. Batoni is exactly what you told the, paragraph, the tribunal in paragraph 10 of your witness statement, namely that the concession agreement does not limit Fremont's right to make third-party coal sales. I told him it was not wholly clear whether those sales could be made. That's what I said to him. Now, if we look at the uh, continuation of your description of this, this meeting, 
that you say took place in the middle of October, um, you say, quote, uh, and I'm looking, I believe, at paragraph 17, I'm sorry, paragraph 18 of your witness statement. It's the second sentence, ma'am, if you want to follow along with me. Quote, Horace said that we should do everything we could to improve our legal position, close quotes. Do you see that? I can see that. Now, at any time when you've advised anyone with respect to Juristanian law, have you ever suggested anything other to them than to them other than that they should do everything they could to Im improve their legal position? I am not a practicing lawyer. I don't advise on Juristanian law. Okay. In any event, even after you said what you now claim you said to Mr. Batoni about the ambiguity of the concession contract, he still said to you, did he not, as you relate in the last sentence of paragraph 17, quote, Horace told me that he would be willing to negotiate with the government on this issue, close quotes. That's what your witness statement says, correct? That's what Horace told me. And it was after he expressed this view in the meeting in Boston, whenever it took place, that there should, that he was willing to negotiate with the government, that you said to him, in your opinion, such negotiations would be fruitless, correct? Given that the new party had come into play, yes. Indeed, given that the new party had come into power, meaning sometime after the 6th of November, correct? Yes. So your conversation with Mr. Uh, Batoni, we now know, took place in Boston after the 6th of November, correct? No, it took place in October, but as I said to you, that new party had every chance of overtaking the derecho party, which it did, against my better hopes. Well, let me just ask you to focus very carefully, ma'am, on the precise wording of your witness statement. If you look at the third sentence of paragraph 18, the witness statement says, quote, I told Horace that negotiating with the government would be fruitless because it was now controlled by the opposition party, close quotes. Have I read that correctly, ma'am? Yes. Okay. And it was after Horace had asked you to give your opinion about the company's legal position under the contract, after he said he would be willing to negotiate with the government, after you told him that those negotiations would be fruitless, it was after all of those things that you, as you say in paragraph 20 of your witness statement, were able, quote, through hard work and effective persuasion to obtain an order from the Council on Foreign Trade giving the Council's consent to the sale of metallurgical coal from the Teushoku mine, correct? Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Let me ask you to take a look at uh, the last exhibit. I call it, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the Tribunal Exhibit F, because that's the way I've got them numbered. I hope that's right, but it's the last class document on the letterhead of the Council on Foreign Trade of the State of Jurisania. Do you see that, ma'am? Yes. Now, the order that you were referring to in that passage from your witness statement that I just read back to you, paragraph 20, about what you were able to accomplish, you were able to get this letter, isn't that correct? That's, that's the order that you're referring to. I find that difficult to believe because that's dated 2010. I see. Well, um, it's not the case that you ob obtained from uh, Mr. Bogdanov a backdated letter? That's not, that's not in my witness statement. It's not in your witness statement, ma'am? That there is a backdated, that I asked for a backdated letter? No. Well. Let me ask you to take a look at uh, your description of this one conversation that took place in October or November in Boston uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Batoni. 
Is it not the case when you were discussing these things that we just went through um, that you were describing the fact, uh, first of all, about what you thought that the contract, how the contract had certain ambiguities, and the, just a second, please. I'm please. sorry. We'll both look together. How's that? What I, what I want to direct your attention to, uh, Ms. Montero, is the last sentence of paragraph 17. Yes. In that sentence, let's read it together and make sure I've read it correctly. Quote, you say, I told Horace, however, that the wisest course of action would be to negotiate with the proper ministries to work, obtain their consent to past and future sales of metallurgical coal from the mine, period. I apologize, that was the penultimate sentence, not the last sentence. I've read that correctly, have I not? Yes. Okay, so you were recommending to Horace that you go out and get something that obtained consent for past sales, isn't that correct? I did not tell him to go out and do it, but I said that would be our, the wise course of action for the joint venture, yes. And that's eventually what you did, isn't it, ma'am? I went there and I asked, yes, for the past actions to be ratified. I did not ask for a backdated letter. Okay. Mr. Nelson, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just help? I'm Mr. Hammond, Madam Chair. Sorry, Mr. I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Most Hammond, happy I'm to sorry. Be Mr. Nelson. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you just help us? Who was in control on the 1st of July 2010? Who was the CEO at that point? Was in, that, just remind us. Well, in July 2010, we're not absolutely certain, Madam Chairman, I'm not absolutely certain. Uh, what's available to me tells me that there was a change. Oh, I'm sorry, it was uh, 2009, it was 2000, 2011. So, correct. During the period of 2009, I'll have to find it for you. It to would have been a Framingham person, Madam. It would have been a Framingham. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it's of course our position, Madam Chairman, that this letter was indeed backdated, uh, as, as we will uh, seek to enlighten the tribunal now. Um, so it is your testimony that after you had the meeting in Boston, you indeed did undertake, or you did undertake efforts through discussions with Mr. Bogdanoff to obtain consent for past and future sales, correct? retroactive consent for the past sales and consent for the future ones, yes. All right. Let me ask you, ma'am, since I know time is getting short, to look with me, if, if you will, at what I have marked as Exhibit D to these proceedings. Um, it's maybe a little hard to find, but it's captioned, text transmissions obtained from the cell phone of Eric Bogdanov, left in his office, Best European Goods, LLP. Now, you tell us in your witness statement that that was Mr. Bogdanov's company, Best European Goods, correct? Yes. All right. And do you recognize um, these text transmissions to have been transmissions that were exchanged between you and Mr. Bogdanov uh, in early November of 2012? They were not exchanged with me. They're from his phone. I don't know who they were for. Okay. You have no idea whatsoever who was the author of the, sin, the opposite end from Mr. Bogdanov. That's your testimony, ma'am? I, I don't know. L let me ask you, if, if you could, to look at the entry uh, for the 6th of November, 2012, at 2119 hours. That's right after um, there's an entry in the, at the end of the preceding transmission that says, don't try to put pressure on me. Yes. Okay. Let's read together the following, the, the, the subsequent entry for 2119. Quote, you have the authority and the legal right, as I have explained to you, you get this letter for me and I forget the dollars you owe me. It is just that simple. I gave you a draft, just put it on stationery and sign it, close quotes. So yeah. you would agree with me that whoever it was that was corresponding here was comfortable in suggesting to the recipient that the recipient had the authority and the legal right to do what the recipient had characterized as having pressure put on him, correct? 
yes, for all I know, this, uh, this was Mr. Batoni's at the other end. I have no idea. Well, uh, you, so it's your testimony that you had separate, wholly independent contact uh, with Mr. Bogdanov, is that correct? No, that's not my testimony. My testimony is that I don't know who these were meant for and where they came from. Okay. Now, if we read on, we see that whoever it was that was corresponding or texting with uh, Mr. Bogdanov had prepared a draft of the letter, isn't that correct? Correct. And had insisted that he simply put it on stationery and sign it, correct? Correct. Now, later on, if you will just take a moment with me and look at the entry for for the 6th of November at 2310 hours, there's a suggestion, don't forget, quote, more is due because the date is in July, not now, close quotes. Do you see that, ma'am? I can see that. And uh, the letter that is Exhibit F is, in fact, dated in July, isn't that correct? 2010, yes. Well, the uh, Exhibit D doesn't tell us which year in July we're talking about, is that correct? C, yes, no it doesn't. All right. So, let me ask you this. Was there ever any other piece of paper that was received by the Board of Directors of Fremont Limited that in any way constituted a consent by the Council on Foreign Trade to these third-party sales? Apart from, apart from Exhibit F. Apart from Exhibit F. I haven't seen any other. Okay. So uh, let me then once again go back and focus, if we may, and I'll try and get through this. I think we're almost done. Uh, I don't want to be... Um, too repetitive, but I think this is a very, very uh, important point. When you say, ma'am, in paragraph 20 of your affidavit, that, quote, I was able, I was able, through hard work and effective persuasion to obtain an order from the Council on Foreign Trade giving the Council's consent to the sale of metallurgical coal from the Teishoku mine. The only order that you can point this tribunal to is Exhibit F, correct? That's the only one on file, yes. Madam Chairman, I'll reserve any further time I have for Thank the you uh, very much, recross Mr. of this witness. Thank uh, you. Mr. As we're running short of time, we um, will defer uh, re-examination but unusually, uh, I will ask my co-arbitrators if they've got any questions at this stage of the witness. Uh, Ms. Montero, I, uh, I'm curious about one thing. I've, you were questioned at some length about your witness statement in paragraphs uh, 10 and 18 about the date of the, uh, the meeting that you had in Boston. Uh, and the, that second sentence of paragraph 18 then goes on and, as Mr. Hammond was asking you, uh, says where you told Mr. Batoni about the government already being in control. Uh, and it, it, there was obviously a problem here that, that uh, this doesn't seem to square. Did you have conversations with Mr. Batoni other than at that, that meeting? Are you talking about something that happened at that meeting or some other time? I, uh, I accept that this uh, sentence does not square with the fact that uh, there was a meeting in mid-October because I'm talking about a party that's already in control. And I can only uh, say that it, I was probably thinking about some other conversation that I must have had with him in that time frame after the election. Um, but I can say, I, I, I am absolutely uh, truthful when I say that I, first of all, the meeting did take place in mid-October. And secondly, I did anticipate that the, the retro party was on the way down. And therefore, that's, what, that's the statement that paragraph 18 is probably something that came afterwards and that I weaved into this paragraph inadvertently. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Monterey, can I just ask a couple of questions, please? First of all, um, going back a little in history, when um, your company invested in the joint venture, 
Presumably, um, detailed due diligence was undertaken. Is that correct? Yes. And did that due diligence include any surveys to the types of coal that the mine would produce? At the time, we uh, commissioned a survey on, for the reserves of coal so to, to find out whether there was any point in, in investing at all. But I don't recall that there was any talk about the different types that, were, that could be present. We were interested in steam coal, and there was that. But no consideration as to metallurgical coal? Uh, in extent. those days, no. Uh, and the second question, um, Daisy Chapman, whose name we heard of this afternoon, um, can you just tell us a, a little bit uh, about her? It doesn't sound a very ju Juristanian name. But no, she's Canadian. <laughs> and can you just tell us a little bit about her qualification? She is uh, a, geolo a geologist. And she is someone whom I met when I was in college in Canada, long time, long standing friend. Thank you. Well, I think that brings these proceedings to a, an adjournment because there is still some re-examination which uh, we're not going to have this afternoon. So I'm now going to go out of chairman mode and once again and hand over to La Larry. I'd like to bring uh, <coughs> Tim Nelson, is he here? Yeah. To come up here and um, This was a <clears throat> difficult cross-examination because there was a, a minefield <clears throat> that um, in the form of <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> Framingham companies having made sales of coal and pocketed the proceeds and not shared them with <clears throat> Sandra Montero, which must have irked her considerably. Um, so that, the questioning uh, had to be <coughs> structured in a way that, that would uh, avoid having her get into that area. Um, I think maybe the best way to start would be to ask the tribunal what you thought were the effective uh, <coughs> points in the examination and what you would um, feel was effectively done and what was not so effectively done. Well, <coughs> perhaps I can just start by, if, if I may, just twist the, the question slightly. I think one of the fundamental differences, apart from style, etc., was that uh, Tim didn't go into the bribery area, whereas Steve did. And it might be worth just asking the reasons why they did yeah. took those different approaches. Go ahead, Tim. I mean, obviously, the, there are um, other questions, but that was a, a, a big difference, I think. Well, um, I'll begin with, we, I was talking with Ben at lunch about Irving Younger, and Irving Younger's speech about never ask a question that you don't know the answer to, and the classic example Younger gives is a asking a witness, you love your mother, don't you? And you always need to assume the answer is no, I have an Oedipus complex, I hate my mother. <laughs> right. So um, any question about that series of texts, in my view, bore an extreme risk of exposure to Framingham because I was going to assume that she would dump our guy, hook, line and sinker, into the same rather unsavory business. So my strategy was to get her to say at the end that this was a panicked political move that didn't really matter, that it wasn't necessary to get this consent anyway. But the way that the question I asked about halfway through that tipped me off to her predisposition was I said, you've written an article speaking out against corruption. And most people would say, yes, I did. You hedged and you sort of said, well, nod, nod, wink, wink, not really. And to me, that was anyone who's prepared to say that before a tribunal is also going to say, and guess what, Framingham was in it waist deep. So th that was my policy of, of attempting to create as much of a firewall as possible between... And I, I spotted was the last sentence of paragraph 11, I will check with Boston. Yes, yes, that, that, was, that was going to be, in my, in my view, all downside. So 
the better view was to try to insulate the whole episode as legally uh, unnecessary. And, and she said in her final answer, look, I really only got it for political cover. And in a sense, that's a, that's a self-serving answer for both sides in this case. So that was my, you know, I don't really know what the law, the, the, that was my instinctive view of what the law would get both sides in this case, but... All downside. I also don't think this is a case where framing him, rationally speaking, was expecting to, to get a big payday. So it's, you know, she's got her money, it's in Vanuatu somewhere, I'll never get it, but if she wins, she gets all of my money, I'm in Boston, right? So I don't see this case as having enormous upside for framing him. It's, it's mainly loss mitigation. One of the striking things here is the, the backdated date, uh, combined with the uh, colloquy uh, between the, the, pretty clearly the two of them. <clears throat> uh, Steve, with, what were you accomplishing or trying to accomplish there? Were you trying basically to, to uh, attack her as a corrupt individual? Well, I guess if you have to ask the question, I didn't do it very effectively. <laughs> um, it seems to me that this is a case that ultimately comes down to he said, she said, uh, obviously, it's against the background of potential corruption. And in sifting through the record, <clears throat> it seemed to me that there were a few pieces, and I tried to highlight them, of her testimony that didn't ring true. And certainly the most significant of those was this notion that she, and she wasn't quite, she was cagey in her witness statement, and she gave that to me. I wasn't sure that she would. Um, that, the, that the meeting took place in October, and yet her statement seems to suggest that can't be right. Uh, and I recognize Jim's comeback. I'm, I'm the arbitrator who appointed Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew who appointed you, Jim. But the point is, when you read the transmission of texts, and you put that together with her declaration that she went out on her, on her own and got this order, the only way for her to go, which is the way she went, is to say, oh, but you know, I told you that I did everything, but actually my answer to those text messages is, I had nothing to do with that. That must have been somebody that I don't have any knowledge of. So it seemed to me that that was worth going after credibility because if in fact, I think the other reason it's interesting, and I didn't have time, unfortunately, to develop this, but it would have been argumentative anyway, is that if, in fact, uh, my suspicion was correct that the meeting actually took place on the 6th of November, I'm sorry, after the 6th of November, that means that effectively the deal was done already before she got on the plane and go to Boston because the text messages are dated the 6th of November and earlier. So if the tribunal credits that she was the person sending the texts, I believe she is completely impeached, and I would have said that in the closing briefs, and I simply didn't want to give her any opportunity to give me some explanation I hadn't thought of yet as to how um, you could square those various facts. It seems to me her story then becomes a lie. Tribunal have, have comments? Uh, well, I just, uh, really, the same question I was, I was just going to ask Steve is, is what about I will check with Boston? How well, there was another line. That, that you know, passed. unfortunately, we have, to, we have to make all of these. I, I, I had, in fact, I was rather anticipating a question from the tribunal at that point. Um, and that's clearly an issue. Uh, my response is that Boston is not necessarily Batoni. Had I had time, I might have tried to play early on. I have them written up here. 